guys, welcome back to Revive School. You know, some of you are still scratching your head. You can't believe you're still doing it. <laughs> hey, join the club, you know? That's the reality is that when you study the Word of God every day, you're kind of like, man, this is a lot. It takes some crazy discipline. And hopefully in this discipline, whatever the format you're learning, maybe by you're reading by yourself and the Holy Spirit speaking to you, maybe it's through this video, maybe it's through Kevin and getting all of his accurate numbers correctly, you know, whatever it is, hopefully you're being encouraged some way. Maybe it's just simply by looking at Mindy's painting and the Holy Spirit speaks to you through Mindy's painting. You know, whatever it is, our prayer is that you just want to grow, grow closer to the Lord in this whole process. That, that's really our desire. And then as a result, the people around you will, will continue to see a change. They'll see the light that's inside of you and they'll want what you have. And that's why we're going through this verse by verse at times and, you know, story by story and you know, we radically want to see this nation turn to the Lord. We want to radically see the country that you're from turn to the Messiah. And so my prayer is that, that even from Matthew 12, we would learn some lessons from the Israelites. And so, you know, just yesterday we, we talked about John the Baptist. <laughs> and John the Baptist, you know, is he Elijah or is he not Elijah? Well, we learned that in Matthew 11, 14, Kevin, if you'll go there, we learned that there was a chance that he could have been the fulfillment of Malachi 4, 5. If they would have embraced the gospel message, if they would have embraced the, the, the kingdom of heaven message and then embraced John, John the Baptist's words, he then would have been Elijah. But they didn't. They said no. And so what you're in is from Matthew 10 all the way up to really Matthew 28. The Jews just continue to say no to the king, King Jesus. So as you go into Matthew 12, just so you know, that's kind of the, the process of, of where we are at. But I'm going to jump really in the middle of Matthew 12 because of time. He's constantly having interactions, okay, in Matthew 12 with the religious, okay? He's talking about being the Lord of the Sabbath. He's talking about healings with the, the paralyzed hands. He's talking about he is serving as a servant of the Lord. But then he even gets into the whole house divided, right? You, you got to find your allegiance. You can't go one way or the other. We talk about the fruit. But really where I want to go to is in some of your Bibles, it might be listed the sign of Jonah. You're like, wait a minute, Jonah? Jonah, that's in the Old Testament. Yeah, we're going to be talking about two stories. Sorry, can't get away from this. The Old Testament today. So in Matthew 12, verse 38, it says this, Then some of the scribes and Pharisees, they said to him, Teacher. And I love how, you know, they always have different titles. Rabbi, teacher, you know. Uh, in some, some contexts, you know, the centurion, right? The guy in charge of 100 soldiers. Uh, he, he said, Lord, right? And so he says, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. Now look, it's a setup. Have you guys ever had these kind of setups before? Like, you remember King Herod? Remember how he said, hey, 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 wise men, go find the star so I can come worship Jesus, so I can worship the King of Jews. Man, it's all set up. It's a lie. Do you really think these guys want to see a sign from Jesus? No, they just want to catch him somehow doing something wrong. <laughs> You know, that, yeah, that, that's it. In fact, uh, Stanley Toussaint, you know, he was one of my former professors at Dallas Seminary. He says, although their rejection of the, the king is, it's certain. Like we already know that the rejection is going to be certain. The scribes and the Pharisees, they approach the king, though, in an antagonistic unbelief. And they want to seek a sign from him. And it's just like, hey, let's just play this game. Let's just stir the pot some more. And that's really what you see in verse 38. And in fact, <laughs> They believe that uh, the Jews believe that there is nobody that could, is going to produce a sign right now. They don't expect it. And so in verse 39, after they said, we want to see a sign. OK, ready for this? Well, let me just say this. They, if they do want a sign, it better be of an astronomical, as John MacArthur says, proportion. Like what we see, if you're really going to show up and produce, it better be the best thing of all things. So there's, there's really no way he's going to win. Throughout scriptures, they describe the, the wonderful Pharisees and the Sadducees and the religious as they're looking for these signs. In fact, Kevin, if you'll go to Luke 11, verse 16. Luke 11, verse 16, just it talks about this, this mindset and, and others as a test were demanding of him a sign from heaven. Like this is how drastic it is, right? We're not just talking like a road sign that says Jesus. You know, we're not looking for a road sign that just says, yep, this is the sign you're looking for. Can you imagine if they had that in Israel at the time? <laughs> no, they wanted something drastic, you know, a, a sign from heaven. One more, Kevin, if you would, go to 1 Corinthians 1, 22. 1 Corinthians 1, 22. This is the sign, okay? They're constantly looking for signs. 1 Corinthians 1, 22 says, For the Jews ask for signs, and the Greeks seek wisdom. 
It's just kind of what the Jews are, they want. They want signs and they want it to be big. And they, I'm telling you, you better, you better make sure it's right. And unbelievers, okay, they seek a sign just for sign's sake. But one commentator says, a believer though will seek a sign for authentic, authentication. Okay, see, make the difference. There's a big difference in, in all of this. And even more so is that God at times granted signs to uh, his people in the past, but he did it to strengthen uh, their weak faith. Abraham, he needed a sign. Uh, Joshua, he needed a sign. Gideon, <laughs> Gideon needed a couple signs. But that was really just to bolster up their faith. It wasn't to say, hey, prove it to me. It was just, God, I just need to know affirmation. Can you just show me a little bit more in this? So when Jesus in verse 39, when he hears the Jews basically giving them lip service, he says, he answered them, an evil and adulterous generation demands a sign. So there's going to be no sign given to you except the sign. You ready for this? Oh, except the sign of the prophet Jonah. I'd be like, wait, what? Let's back up here. He calls them an evil and adulterous generation. Whenever you think of the Old Testament and the Pentateuch, do you not think of the Jewish people constantly committing spiritual adultery? Do you know what I mean? Like they're constant like, oh yeah, let's go to the foreign gods. Oh yeah, let's marry some uh, uh, women of different ethnicities. Let's follow their false gods. And then, okay, we're sorry, God. And then they come back. It's just this ongoing spiritual adultery. And that's what you see in scripture. In Jeremiah 3, verse 10, if you'll go there. Let's go through a couple of the prophets talking about how this is how the Israelites were. And Jesus was just really reiterating that. Yet in spite of all this, this is Jeremiah 3.10, in spite of all of this, her treacherous sister Judah didn't return to me with all her heart, only in pretense. This is the Lord's declaration. One more, a couple more. Hosea 7, verse 13. It was kind of like, ah, I'm coming kind of, right? Woe to them, for they fled from me. Destruction to them, for they rebelled against me. Though I want to redeem them, they speak lies against me. Verse 14. They do not cry to me from their hearts. Rather, they wail on their beds. They slash themselves for grain and wine, and they turn away from me. In verse 15. I trained and strengthened their arms, but they plot evil against me in verse 16. They turn, but not to what is above. They're like a faulty bow. Their leaders will fall by the sword because of the cursing of their tongue. They will be ridiculed for this in the land of Egypt. Here you have prophets describing the adulterous lifestyle of their, of their spiritual life. Just for one more, go to Isaiah 57 verse 3. When Jesus calls them an evil and adulterous generation, he's really just emphasizing how they've been in the past. But come here, you sons of a sorceress, offspring of an adulterer and a prostitute. Who is it you are mocking? Who is it you're opening your mouth and sticking out your tongue at? Isn't it you, you rebellious children, you race of liars, who will burn with lust among the oaks, under every flourishing tree, who slaughter children in the wadis below the clefts of the rocks. Verse six, the prophet's just getting going. Your portion is among the smooth stones of the wadi. Indeed, they are your lot. You've even poured out a drink offering to them. You've offered a grain offering. Should I be satisfied with these? Verse seven, you've placed your bed on a high and lofty mountain. You also went up there to offer sacrifice. And then in verse eight, you've set up your memorial behind the door and doorpost. For away from me, you stripped, went up, made your bed wide, and you have made a bargain for yourself with them. You have loved their bed and you have gazed on their genitals. Whoa. So then he begins to unfold in verse 40. For as Jonah was in the belly of the great fish three days and three nights, so the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. Wow. This is awesome. Like when I read this, this should just stir an excitement and you're like, okay, he just compared Jonah in a fish to Jesus dying. And then some of you are already like, Dude, it wasn't three days and three nights. Like, there's a lot of people that go to this verse and say, this is not accurate. I don't understand. How, how could this be? Jesus, the reality was, is what? You know, if he, was, if he died on a Friday and his resurrection occurred on a Sunday, that's not a full three days and three nights, right? That is true. When you do the math, it's not there. You're like Friday going on to Saturday and then you go on to Sunday, but then that's not three nights. It's three days days, a Friday, a Saturday, and a Sunday. And just so you know, I, I had to really do some research on this because these are the kind of things that maybe bother me. Maybe they don't bother you. Douglas O'Donnell, uh, he referenced how ancient Jews calculated times back then. And what they would have done is a new day began after sunset and a part of a day was often counted as a whole day. That make sense? 
So, and there's multiple examples in scripture in Genesis 40, 1 Kings 20. There's five examples that reference even counting days like this. Okay. There are similar examples to this reference of Jonah and Jesus. So just want to, I don't, I want to run past that one and be like, oh, you didn't want to address that. All right. So now watch this. Okay. If you would, what, what does this look like? What does this mean when it says um, that he is in the heart of the earth three days and three nights? Well, if you go to Jonah 2, verse 3, here's the comparison, okay? Uh, Jonah 2, verse 3, Scripture just says this. You threw me into the depths, into the heart of the seas, and the current overcame me. Remember, Jonah's, right? This is a major problem. He's in the depths of the sea, in the hearts of the sea, and the current overcame me. All your breakers and your billows swept over me. Now, if you'll go to Psalm 46, 2, okay, I want to build the case of what is this depths? What is this heart of the seas, the heart of the earth? What, what, what are we going here? Therefore, we will not be afraid, though the earth trembles and the mountains topple into the depths of the sea. When Jesus is referencing the heart of the earth, he's referencing, you guys, very simply, his death. He's referencing Jesus' own death. That's what he's referencing here, okay? So now in this process, hang on, I want to go to my notes here if I can. Uh, in this process, two things. There are some problems that people had, okay? In referencing Jesus' death and burial, I, I needed to add burial on that, sorry. Uh, his deliverance from the death in the grave, okay? We're going to talk about the, the deliverance side. The problem is, is that the Jews, they believed that he died, okay? They actually believed that he died, and in fact, Luke 24, 18 will show this, will prove this. In Luke 24, 18, remember the road to Emmaus? Okay, in the road to Emmaus, they're talking, they're walking. Maybe husband and wife, they're talking. That's an interesting story on that. Cleopas is, is answering Jesus, but they don't know it's Jesus. And he says, Cleopas says, are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that happened there in these days? Right now, he hasn't, he hasn't shown himself as a, as a resurrected form that they know. He's obviously standing right in front of them and and he says, what things? And they said, well, the things concerning Jesus, the Nazarene, who was a prophet, powerful in action and speech before God and all the people. And then it continues on. And, and our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. The Jews at that point, they were literally in the understanding that he's dead and he's buried and that's it. So they're keeping in a posture of death. They didn't believe that Jesus came to life. They didn't believe that he came back to life. So it's crazy, though, is that he, Jesus is going to keep making these, these, these parallels with Jonah in the, in, the, in the belly, okay? But he doesn't just stay in the belly, you understand? He doesn't just stay dead. He doesn't stay in the belly. He doesn't just stay dead. He actually comes back to life, meaning Jesus. And so watch this as this unfolds. In verse 41, okay, the men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment. Why? Because this is important. Jonah did not just stay in the belly of the whale, of the fish. Okay, do you see the comparison? If Jonah had stayed there, all of the men of Nineveh would have never been able to actually repent to the message that he's going to say. So Jonah had to, quote unquote, come back to life in order for Ninevites to experience true repentance. Jesus had to come back to life from the depths and the belly of, of, of the earth, the heart of the earth. Why? So that we could be given repentance. And so the comparison is this, that the men of Nineveh will stand up at the, at the judgment with this generation, okay? Meaning the Jewish people that are saying no, he's standing up with, the, they're standing up with the generation and they condemn it. Why? Because they repented at Jonah's proclamation. They said yes to the message. Therefore, they can actually bring forth judgment against the Jews that are saying no to Jesus's message. Okay, that was a lot. <laughs> okay, that was a lot. Jonah is in the fish. He comes out. He doesn't want to come out and he doesn't even want to go to Nineveh, but he does. And he delivers a message, right? And he, he goes up to them and he says, you need to repent. In 40 days, you need to repent. And guess what? They do. The Ninevites repent and they actually turn to God. Well, how do we, how do we know? Jonah 3, verse 5. The men in Nineveh, after the, the message went out, they believed in God. They proclaimed a fast, dressed in sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least. Verse 6. When the word reached the king of Nineveh, he got up from his throne, took off his royal robe, put on sackcloth and sat in ashes. All because Jonah came out of the fish, delivered the message, the Ninevites repented, the king of Nineveh, he repented. In verse seven, it says this, then he issued a decree in Nineveh by order of the king and his nobles, no man or beast, herd or flock is to taste anything at all. They must not eat or drink water. Verse eight, 
Furthermore, both man and beast must be covered with sackcloth and everyone must call out earnestly, look at this, to God, everybody. Each one must turn from his evil ways and from the violence he is doing. Keeps going to verse nine. Who knows, God may turn and relent. He may turn from his burning anger so that we will not perish. And then in verse 10, then God saw their actions that they had turned from their evil ways. So God relented from the disaster he had threatened to do them and he did not do it. So the Ninevites, okay, a Gentile group, a non-Jewish group, here, a prophet from Israel, okay, this is really an unusual story about this, is that um, a prophet from Israel goes to, to deliver a message in, to a Gentile community and they respond. And because they repent and they respond, they have the right to yes, as we, now you can go back to verse, 40, uh, verse 41, they have a right to then what? Stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn them, condemn it because they responded properly and the Jews still have not done that. I've already given you a sign, he says. It's through Jonah, it's through your prophet who, uh, by the way, it's pointing to me. It's a really cool picture. Now, the argument will be that even in today's standards, oh, well, the Ninevites didn't really say yes. Because then that's where we go to Nahum 3, Kevin. Nahum 3, verse 7. So I, I want to make sure I'm getting all your angles of your arguments here. It says, then all who you see will recoil from you, saying Nineveh is de devastated. Who will show sympathy to her? Where can I find anybody to comfort you? Verse 8. Are you better than Thebes who sat, that sat along the Nile with water surrounding her, whose rampart was the sea, the river, her wall? And so basically, one generation later, the Ninevites went back to the old ways of doing things. Well, <laughs> if you're anything in the business of revival, <laughs> or you're in the business of quote unquote transformation, I mean, this happens all the time. People say yes to the Lord, they turn to the Messiah, and then what do you know, a year later, you're like, did you, did you guys... Hopefully that's not the case and I'm not making and being an advocate for it. I'm just telling you the reality is, is that sometimes it happens. And so we don't know if there was authentic conversions. We don't know where they're at with the eternal state. But according to this, they will stand up at judgment with this generation and they're going to condemn the Jews that are saying no. It's pretty, pretty forward, but I think it's a pretty, pretty clear sign. Now, before we jump on to verse 42, I want to go somewhere here. I think this is kind of fun. I want to walk through, um, I think we talked about this yesterday, about how John the Baptist was greater than, uh, and Kevin, you made sure you clarified, and I think this is good, he's greater than the Old Testament prophets. And why? Because he's walking out the fulfillment, right, of those words. And then all of a sudden, I keep going over here like I'm on a timeline. Uh, you know, and then you go over here, you have even the least of us, okay, the ones that are barely scraping by in the kingdom, right, Jeff? That's what we're talking about. Those, us, were greater than John the Baptist because we're walking out the message, the prophetic word that he's releasing that we get to embrace. Okay, does that make sense? So now where I want to go with this is why is Jesus greater than Jonah? Okay, that's where I want to go a little bit here. Obviously, We've, we've talked about it. We've shown the stories. But why is Jesus greater than Jonah? Again, I love what uh, Dr. Tom Constable says. I love what John MacArthur says about this. Well, one is, is that I'm going to just kind of just, he's greater in his person because Mo Jonah was a mere man, but even Jesus in his just being a person was greater. I I'll kind of break this down, but I want to walk you through this. In his, he's greater in his pers per per person, excuse me, for Jonah was a mere man. Okay, Jesus was greater in his obedience. For Jonah, what did he do? He disobeyed. He disobeyed God and then was chastened. Jesus actually died. That's a big deal. Jonah just sat in the belly of a fish. So Jonah didn't actually die. So, I mean, you could actually even say through Jesus' death, that was greater than Jonah's not dying. Jesus arose from the dead under his own power. I, was, I, I, I just, I love that, um, I don't know, I don't always have one word for these things. We'll just put a rose from the dead. Jonah didn't do that. <laughs> uh, this is an interesting one. Jonah ministered only to one city and he didn't do it that well, <laughs> right? And Jesus gave his whole life for the world. And you're like, oh, that's a good Jesus one, right? He gave his life for the world. Jonah had, you know, <laughs> one city. He's got the whole world in his hands. Jonah's got one city. 
All right, so another one is, is that Jesus' love was greater because <laughs> Jonah, he didn't love the Ninevites at all. <laughs> so Jesus' love was greater, right? I think that's an awesome one. Uh, and then uh, J- uh, Jonah's message saved Nineveh, Nineveh from judgment and the wrath of God. Uh, and I think that's a, a, an incredible, powerful message. But then Jesus has the message of salvation. So all of the above, what you see is that Jesus is greater. But I, I do think it's a pretty cool comparison in what you see. There, there's a whole lot more. And I think one of the things I'm trying to, to teach each one of us more and more in this is that slow down and observe the scriptures. You'll get more of this if you just camp out on the scriptures. Say, How else is Jesus greater than Jonah? You, you could come up with a lot more, I'm sure, of your list. Um, so anyway, there we are. Now let's go to verse 42, and this is how we're going to wrap it up. Because <laughs> we, just, we just talked about the sign of Jonah. And remember, this whole conversation started with, you know, uh, the religious wanted um, a sign. Like, hey, teacher, would you please show us a sign? And then he called them an evil and adulterous generation. And he says, no sign for you. And he says, by the way, you're not going to get it through, through me, but you're going to get it through Jonah. And, oh, I'll give you one more. Verse 42, it says, the queen of the south will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. Because she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And look, something greater than Solomon is here. So now you almost have to just be like, okay, okay, I'm done with that comparison of Jesus and Jonah. Now now we got to do a comparison of Jesus and Solomon. Okay, let's just kind of unpack. First of all, the queen of the south is who? Isn't it the Queen Sheba? Sheba. You got it. Queen of Sheba. Uh, Actual historical figure. Uh, They would say Sheba was um, from the Arabian Peninsula. And the Jews would have labeled the Arabian Peninsula as like the ends of the earth. Uh, Kevin, can you go to Jeremiah 6, 20? Now think about this. And that's kind of important. Somebody that came from the ends of the earth to come check out their king. Right? So they came a long way. So here it is in Jeremiah 6, 20. What used to me is frankincense from Sheba or sweet cane from a distant land. Whenever you think of Sheena, you think it's not even close to here. So now the queen of Sheba hears about this incredible man named Solomon. So would you go to 1 Kings chapter 10, verse 1? The queen of Sheba, she heard about Solomon's fame and connected with the name of Yahweh and came to test him with difficult questions. Verse 2. She came to Jerusalem with a very large entourage, with camels bearing spices, gold and great abundance, and precious stones. So like she came to bless him, right? But also to test him. She came to Solomon and she spoke to him about everything that was on her mind. Now this is a queen, okay? So she's not like this, you know, somebody just off the street. Like she knows she's got her act together. Verse three, it says this. So Solomon answered all her questions and nothing was too difficult for the king to explain to her. Verse four. When the queen of Sheba observed all of Solomon's wisdom, the palace that he had built, verse five, the food at his table, his servant's residence, his attendant service and their attire, like even his attendants, they they dress nice. His cupbearers and the burnt offerings he offered at the Lord's temple, it took her breath away. Verse six, she said to the king, the report I heard in my own country about your words and about your wisdom is true. Verse seven, But I didn't believe the reports until I came and I saw with my own eyes. You know, right away, it just kind of makes me think of uh, uh, John the Baptist's disciples. Remember, he says, what you hear and what you see, I need to make sure you go back. I need you to go testify to John the Baptist. I'm here to see and experience something absolutely incredible. And indeed, I was not even told half. Your wisdom and your prosperity far exceed the report I heard. And in verse 8, how happy are your men. How happy are these servants of yours who always stand in your presence hearing your wisdom. Verse nine, may Yahweh your God be praised. Now, I wanna just slow down here on this. You understand that because of Jonah, and then he got spit out of the fish, and then he goes around saying, repent, or God's gonna destroy you. They do, right? And then what do they do? The king actually turns and it requires everybody to fast and everybody to, to turn to the Lord, right? It's exactly what happens here. Because of Solomon and all of his greatness and his wisdom and everything that he has, because of what he's been given, may Yahweh your God be praised. Queen Sheba then actually worships and turns to God. He delighted in you and put you on the throne of Israel because of the Lord's eternal love for Israel. 
He has made you king to carry out justice and righteousness. Verse 10. Then she gave the king four and a half tons of gold, a great quantity of spices and precious stones. Never again did such a quantity of spices arrive as those the queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. Here you have Gentiles are responding to God. Both groups, Ninevites, Queen Sheba are responding and the Jewish people choose not to respond. The Jewish people refuse to re respond to this message of the kingdom of God at hand. And Jesus says, I've already given you signs that point to me. In Jonah's situation, I've already proven I'm greater than him. And now in, in the Solomon situation, and look, something greater than Solomon is here. And it is, it's me. They don't want a sign. They don't want a sign at all. And the craziest, the weirdest thing about what I'm going to say is, is because they didn't want it, we got it. So in a weird way, I'm saying, praise God, they said no. So that we could have life. But my prayer is, at one point, they will see Zechariah 10, 12, 10 come to fruition. They will actually mourn over the signs that they've been given. They'll mourn over the one that they have actually pierced. And they'll mourn as such as they've, 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 they're mourning for their only child. They'll weep bitterly for the one as that they are missing. And I'm telling you, Jesus says, I've given you the signs. When will you realize <laughs> I'm right in front of you? You know, Jesus is greater than Jonah. Jesus is greater than Solomon. Why is Jesus greater than Solomon? Well, one, he's greater than his wisdom, wealth, and works. Okay, I think that's kind of an obvious one. Uh, I'm just going to shorten it and just put... Jesus has more wisdom because he gave it to, to Solomon. And I love that Queen Sheba was amazed at Solomon's kingdom. But what we have in the kingdom of God far surpasses Solomon's kingdom. And so I'll just say Jesus' kingdom offers a lot more. And then I think this is cool. The last point is this. The commentator says, to sit at Christ's table and hear his words and share his blessings they're more satisfying than ever to, to visit and admire the most spectacular kingdom, even Solomon's. When you get to sit at the table with Jesus, I promise you, you'll know it's greater. You know, the Jews wanted signs, and he says, I've given them to you. Through Jonah, through Queen Sheba, through the Ninevites, through Solomon, I've given it to you. The question is, is do you really want that sign? You know, as an application, all I wanted to say is, is that some of you right now today, you're trying to make a decision and you're asking for more signs. Don't ask for signs, honestly, to test him. Okay? Only ask if you need it for an affirmation for the next step. It's kind of the beauty of all this. Jesus says, I want to speak to you. I want to, I want to respond to you. Just come and talk to me. There's a lot more to Matthew 12 in the beginning and at the end. But hopefully you guys continue to read the word and the Lord will continue to show more and more every day. Thanks, guys. Mm -hmm.